Hello there and welcome to a very interesting location in southern Nevada. We are at the south end of the Spring Mountains, about 30 minutes drive west of Las Vegas. Um, maybe back down this way you might be able to make out Highway 160 uh, and also a road heading up to the big mountain to our south which is Mount Potosi. Uh, we're not going to look so much at the rocks to the south we're going to mainly focus on these rocks here in the foreground, these beige colored rocks. And what I'd like to do is um, <clears throat> see if we can identify these rocks and then unravel together this really amazing story that we have at this location. Thanks for joining me. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. So we're going to look at two main units of rock today and we're going to see a really interesting relationship between the two. So hang with me and I hope you find this really interesting and enjoyable. So let's start with some basic observations with this tan colored rock we see right in front of me here. Um, we can see that there's some layering in the rocks. Uh, if we grab a piece of it, pick it up, look at it, uh, it's, it's, it's gritty to the touch, it's grainy. Um, I don't see any crystals in it. It feels like it's sandy in texture. So if you've guessed this is a sandstone, you are correct. We are looking at a quartz rich, medium grain sandstone with uh, bedding in it. And in places, we might be able to see cross bedding, um, which is indicative of wind blown deposition. But let's walk up the hill together and let's see how this rock changes as we go up the hill. So there's some gray rock covering it in places, and we'll get to that eventually. But there's a definite change in color. We've got the beige colored rocks here, and now just as we're crossing this old trail or ATV track, there's a distinct color change from these beige buff colored sandstones to more of a reddish color and the outcrops here a little covered with the gray rocks so let's head over here where they're weathering out in place and let's pick one up and again very gritty to the touch uh, has distinct layering in it so it looks like it's a sandstone. It's essentially the same sandstone, just a slightly different color than what we saw just below. And if we look here to the northeast, we can see the beige colored sandstone, the reddish unit that we're standing on here. And if you re you're real perceptive, if you look up to the left, you'll see that the rock turns into a different color, this gray rock. So let's work our way up a little bit further. So we're still in this red, sandstone and here we can see the cross beds coming in at angles to the primary bedding surface which is more or less horizontal here but a little bit tricky to see when we're out mapping in geology sometimes contacts between adjacent rock units are not well exposed in a cliff or an outcrop so we sometimes use what's called float mapping and float mapping works like this we can see the red sandstone here and it's outcropping just below us here. We don't know exactly where the contact is between this red sandstone and the gray rocks that are just above, but we can, we can estimate its location by the highest uphill um, exposure or um, occurrence of broken red rocks, what we call float. So these rocks are all probably out of place some of them may be bedrock, but right about here is where I'm seeing the last vestiges of this red sandstone. If I take a couple more steps up the hill, all I'm seeing now is the gray rocks. So we definitely have a contact along this hillside somewhere about where I'm standing at this location. Let's go up to these gray rocks here and identify these rocks. And then we'll put this whole story together and hopefully I'll be able to impress you a bit. Okay, <clears throat> so nice gray 
outcrop it's incredibly sharp um the first thing i noticed putting my hand on it was ow every little edge uh this whole rock even these more flat surfaces here are incredibly sharp to the touch uh bedding here is a little bit harder to see the rock doesn't appear to be made out of crystals uh, so i can exclude igneous rocks uh, it doesn't have crystals or layering that i might see in a metamorphic rock and because the rock below it is a sedimentary rock it would make sense that this is also a sedimentary rock um, it doesn't seem to have large grains the grain size is sort of fine to medium and i didn't bring my handy dandy little acid bottle with me that i normally do so i apologize for that but if i were to have it with me i have no doubt whatsoever that this rock would fizz and react to the acid like crazy indicating that it's totally made out of calcite so this is a limestone we've got limestone here and it appears the limestone goes all the way up the ridge and as i swing around to the east i can see the same units that I just hiked through here, the white um, buff colored sandstone, it becomes a little bit more red near its contact with the gray limestone uh, just above. So um, now up to this point, that may not be too exciting. Um, we've got two, maybe three, if we count the both colors of sandstone, sedimentary units divided here. Um, and this would be no problem, right? You've got an environment that's depositing quartz rich medium grain sand over some period of time so it's a windblown environment the limestone though does beg and demand uh, quite a bit of a different interpretation because that limestone like a lot of limestones that's a marine limestone so that limestone up there was deposited under the ocean so it would demand a very quick change in the depositional environments to go from a windblown sand dune to an ocean environment but maybe that's possible maybe you've got a coastal dune a dramatic rise in sea level and then you can depart start to deposit the limestone there but what i'm really hoping to dazzle you with here is the ages of these rocks and how different they are this red and beige sandstone we've been looking at is the aztec sandstone it's jurassic in age it's the same sandstone that you see at zion national park you see it uh, in Moab and Lake Powell, all throughout Southern Utah. In those areas, it's called the Navajo sandstone, but it's the same as what we have here, a Jurassic sand dune uh, deposited um, material. So it's a sandstone from windblown sands, okay? So stay with me here, Jurassic sandstone here, but up above the limestone we just looked at is Cambrian in age. It's 550 million years old. So the rocks on top are 500 to 550 million years old, and they're sitting on top of sandstones that are about 150 to 180 million years old. So there's the big riddle. How do you get rocks that are older on top of rocks that are younger? Now you could get the whole thing flipped over. There's tectonic forces that would work that way. There might be a fold mechanism that works to produce that. But in this case, what we have is one of the premier examples of a major thrust fault. These gray rocks here to, you, to the left have been shoved up over the top to the right or to the east on top of these beige colored Aztec sandstones, this Jurassic Age sandstone. And to maybe set the stage and hopefully give you a, a better bit of information um, I've got a hopefully helpful diagram here. So let's start with the regional geologic paleogeography that we had about 100 million years ago during the Cretaceous period. So <clears throat> during the Cretaceous period, I'm here in Southern Nevada. Here's Utah, Arizona, and what bit of California existed at the time. This was a time when we had a major mountain building event, a subduction zone along the west coast of north america was sliding one plate beneath the continent causing uh uplift and mountains to form pretty much right on the nevada utah border the rocks out in front of that mountain belt were actually being shoved to the east and there was a large inland sea the cretaceous interior seaway 
that was bisecting the continent out here in what's now Wyoming, uh, Colorado, and some of the Plain states. So these are some of the fun uh, paleogeographic maps that uh, Ron Blakey has put together, former uh, grad, grad professor of mine. Here's a cross-section of what this would have looked like here. The subduction zone, uh, the volcanoes, the volcanic arc, which would have been about where the Sierras are today and into central Nevada and up into uh, western, excuse me, eastern Oregon. And then this big thrust belt here, a big pile of rocks that were being pushed and, sli and uh, collided riding up over the top of each other to form what we call the Severe Thrust Belt, named after Lake Severe or Severe Lake in Idaho. And ahead of that, we'd have what we call the Foreland Basin, a basin uh, that was where all the sediments were being shed off these mountains to the east. So to maybe put a finer point on it, um, let me switch to a different diagram and one that I did at a different location up in Ogden Canyon. So you might've seen something like this before. So how can we get these old rocks on top of these young rocks? Well, let's just start with a simple stack of rocks, sedimentary rocks from old to young. And let's start to squeeze these rocks from east to west. As we do so, we will develop fractures or cracks in the rock, probably taking advantage of the weaker rocks like shales or could be a sandstone, but some weaker material. Eventually that could form a, a fault that actually causes one side to be pushed up and over the other side. So here's the development of the thrust fault shown with the arrow here. So this package of old to young rocks is being pushed up and over the top of the rocks below the fault. This is what we call the foot wall. This is the hanging wall. You can, you can see the geometry here. Now, if we allow some erosion to take place, we're gonna start eroding this big mountain that we've created, which is gonna be preferentially uh, attacked by the elements. Eventually what we get is something like this, where we have our stack of old to young rock in the foot wall, but in the hanging wall, <clears throat> that stack's been eroded and we can have the old rocks placed right on top of the young rocks with the fault being the contact between those two dissimilar rock units. And that's exactly what we have here. We have these Jurassic Age sandstones, the Aztec sandstone, <clears throat> that are completely covered by the um, Cambrian Age limestones. So we're looking at one of the biggest classic premier faults, uh, thrust faults in Western North America. This is called the Keystone Thrust Fault. I'm at the south end of the Spring Mountains, but the more dramatic escarpment just to my north, which I wasn't able to access, it's just too big of a hike and grind to get in there. If you just look west of Las Vegas on Google Earth or some other satellite imagery, you'll see the beautiful Red Rock Canyon National Conservation Area uh, escarpment, and you'll see these big, beautiful cliffs of this very scenic sandstone, but up above them, you'll see these gray rocks that are actually dipping to the west that have been pushed up along these west dipping thrust faults and are capping these sandstones here. So really amazing spot. I'd wanted to make a video here for a while. I hunted for the best place to access and get close to the thrust fault where you could see it in good detail over a small distance. So literally, you know, 30 steps away, down here are the sandstones right under my feet. And maybe another 30 steps back up the hill is the limestone. So we're basically standing more or less right on this immense thrust sheet that's pushed these uh, Cambrian limestones over the top of these Jurassic sandstones. Uh, really exquisite here. So hopefully you've enjoyed this. Appreciate you joining me for this little lesson on stratigraphy, rock types, um, using our identification skills with the rocks, but also specifically looking at how we can get older rocks thrusted on top of younger rocks here at the Keystone Thrust here in Southern Nevada. Thanks for joining me. If you can uh, offer any support, always appreciate it donate button at the on the banner of the home page <coughs> excuse me uh thanks button just below the video viewer on the right and uh under the video description there's always links there as well but appreciate you joining me and we'll see you next time here at 
southern nevada, the spring mountains and the keystone thrust fault.